So today I'm very excited to talk to Professor Katie Barnett and Professor Jeremy Gans about their new book, Guilty Pigs, The Weird and Wonderful History of Animal Law for the Forum, which is an entirely online companion of the UNSW Law Journal. Yeah, Katie, if you'd like to pop up the book for us, that would be fantastic. It's such a great cover with the guilty pig. <laughs> sure it is. Um, so this is the first time that we've actually had the opportunity to interview any authors about their books. So we're very excited to have both of you here, and especially for this discussion to be about such a weird and wonderful book as the title indicates. Um, so we only have a short amount of time, so I, and we'd only be able to, you know, just get into the, scrape the surface of this wonderful book. So um, I reckon we should just get stuck into it really. Um, <laughs> Would either of you both like to introduce yourselves or give an idea as to what your book is about? Um, that would be fantastic. Um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Katie Barnett and I'm a professor at Melbourne Law School. I actually specialise in private law, but uh, Jeremy and I run the High Court blog together. And we have a fascination for quirky cases, especially quirky cases involving animals. Yeah, that's right. So I, I teach criminal law uh, and dabble in a bit of public law. So we together kind of cover a bit of the domestic sphere, but particularly the domestic sphere that intersects with animals. So we, we found ourselves talking a lot. And one of the cases we talked about a bit because it was... Uh, it came up in the High Court around the time we are doing the blog was the case we cover in the, the introduction to the book is Vesta, which is the High Court's main case on animal law, although it's not, it's only, it's only tangentially on animal law, it's really on uh, administrative law, but it uh, uh, really affected one animal in particular, Izzy, whose life was literally saved by the High Court at the last moment. Uh, so that really caught our imagination, as did the fact that the case uh, as well as being about animal law, was such a good illustration of so many bits of, of the law. So that's why we started the book there. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so yeah, the book is quite a, um, a very expansive insight into animals and the law and our relationship with animals and the law then. Um, and just for context, um, for anyone listening, so the book, book covers six core, I guess, dimensions or aspects of the book, um, aspects of animals and the law. So we have owning animals, controlling animals, blaming, understanding, harming, and protecting animals, which means that it covers so many different areas. And yeah, like you said, so the book actually opens with um, this case with Isbesta, which um, is fantastic because this is the next thing which I wanted to ask about was that by using Isbesta, I think what's really clear from the outset is that it's such an accessible book because that case brings up so many different areas of the law, which are really interesting, but you definitely make sure that anyone who reads the book can understand these different elements of the law. So every concept that comes up and in the asbestos case, there's administrative law, there's private law, there's public law that comes up. It's very thoughtfully explained. Um, so why was it important to you that lay people or people who don't really understand the law very well, why was it important to you that they could engage with this book? So that's actually an interesting question. So Jeremy and I met, not in person first, but we met via blogging. So we oh, hadn't really? actually met each other in person. And we both have this real passion for explaining the law to people. I mean, I guess that's why we're professors, right? We <laughs> love explaining the law to people, but not just students. We love to explain it to anyone who listened to us, basically. <laughs> So we wrote it for anyone who's interested to read because that I think has been one of our both of our like passions um, since we met many years ago. Gosh, I don't even know how long ago that was, Jeremy. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, I don't even remember when we first met, but I, like it was a gradual thing, and then think, we, we yeah. both got involved in that high court. One blog. blog after the other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and really, I mean, we're both interested enough in animal law, but we also just saw it as a great opportunity to explain lots of bits of the law that we were interested in, because animal law is like one of those capstone things. It's not really a standalone bit of the law on its own. It just brings together heaps of other bits of the law, and we really love explaining 
those bits of the law. So um, from our publisher's point of view, um, everyone likes animals too. So it's a really a real match made in heaven as far as they're concerned, but it's the explaining we like to do. Yeah, definitely. And I think to people who aren't really familiar with, well, animal law, I think when you come to the book and for example, myself, you expect it to be just one specific body of law that you're learning about. So it's really, really um, fascinating to see just how many different places that animals come up in the law and to see animal law not as just one specific thing, but just a huge body that touches on all sorts of different areas of the law. And it's funny as well, because for me, a lot of the time when you're explaining these different concepts, sometimes I just wish I had the book at hand when I was studying any of my law subjects, because it was just so, so clear and so well explained. So thank you. I, I really appreciated that. Um, and I think that's, there's one other thing which I really noticed from the start with your book, not just in terms of, uh, in terms of your approach. So not just being an accessible book, but also the kind of neutral standpoint which you chose to adopt. So um, from the start, you kind of recognize that the book isn't necessarily about answering how the law should be in terms of animal law, but it has more of a descriptive function and it really comprehensively covers these different areas where animals pop up in the law. And another funny experience as a reader is that you're confronted with these philosophical questions about, human nature and our relationship with animals, but you don't answer it for us. We, we no. have to answer it for ourselves. And I was just wondering why you chose to take this very different approach when it comes to animal law. Oh, well, it, it, oh it, it is a different approach. Um, and we actually, uh, you know, we were well aware there are other animal law books and works out there, um, but we just want to get into it because we, we, we had our own explaining we want to do but we, we quickly found out that we were kind of fairly unique in that most animal law books are out there are very much about advocacy um, and understandably so um, so advocating for animals and calling for law reform and and uh, trying to answer all those questions you raised um, I mean we do our advocacy as well but I think Katie and I have in common also that we like to explain what the law is before we do the advocacy and both of us in our advocacy would like to leave those decisions at the end up to our readers or our, our students rather than trying to convince them of something. We'll just try and put, put enough information and enough views that they can make their own choice. So I think that comes through here too. But it, because neither of us have come to this via animal law, but via our own fields, I think it, it is a little distinct from most animal law books for that reason. Yeah. So, no, I, I definitely agree. And I think that's what's, yeah, what's really different about it. I don't think I realised until we were about halfway through it <laughs> that um, no one else had really written a ball book like that just explaining what the law is and you can probably tell I'm the historian yes. so <laughs> I love all the historical weird facts uh, it's just so fun the things I found um I know <laughs> <laughs> I was so like mind blown by some of these things yeah so it's just amazing medieval killer pigs um goring <laughs> oxen uh, ownership of bees in medieval Ireland. If you ever wanted to know about that, I'm your woman. Fantastic. Well, we'll, we'll definitely talk about some of those, those stories as well, I hope so. Um, and did you, did you then find then, whilst you were writing the book, that you both had different opinions as to different cases and how they should have been handled or stories? I know it's left out of the book, but I'm just curious as to whether there was much, uh, did you see much variation in terms of your thoughts in terms of how we approach approach animals in the law no I don't oh. think we did actually it was all really very smooth um, but, I mean we're both I mean I guess we've got a lot of similarities but at the same time the whole style of the book is so that we try not to be pushy so I think if we had mm. a difference we wouldn't even notice because we'd still be saying the same writing the same stuff even if each of us were coming to different conclusions yeah so, yeah um, I mean, we, we had yeah. slightly different styles of writing, but um, mm -hmm. by the end of it, because we worked on each other's chapters, we converged quite a lot in our styles. We learn a lot from each other writing this book in, in terms of how to write. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I had to de-academic myself a little bit, <laughs> be a little bit more um, uh, laid back. 
<laughs> and I, tell, I tend to to be a bit too much of a storyteller and like to have un, you know have a mystery that unfolds and um got got pulled to be a bit more gentle on the reader and point them tell them where I was going before I got there. Well, you, you both have experience in writing books before. Is that's correct? Is that correct? So Jeremy you have a book, and Katie also wrote wrote a book as well, but fi fictional. Katie's got tons of books. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm a book machine. Yeah, so <laughs> I have written fiction. I've also, and Jeremy's written an excellent book on juries, which he ran the manuscript by me and I actually stayed up until 2am. He can verify this is true. And texted him going, my God, I had to finish it. But um, yeah, okay. so. Um, and I read, okay. I read Katie's novel as well. Um, well, you were a beta reader for my novel, yeah. so which is pretty wacky. It's like a dystopian society. Okay. Um, yeah, but um, I guess we're, we're a little bit unconventional in the way we write, aren't mm -hmm. we, Jeremy? Like, mm -hmm. I think we are a bit more approachable and wanting to talk to people about things in a less academic way hence why we got into blogging in the first place yeah definitely and we did things like um end up getting the publisher to, to not have formal footnotes we put them all at the end yes. sort of thing you know that it took some working out between Katie and me and the publishers we all had different views on how to best do that um but um it, it's a nice it's a nice bit of freedom not to have footnotes after every sentence and all of that Definitely, I agree. And I, I think as a reader as well, it's very freeing because often when I, especially nonfiction books, they even outside of a legal context with footnotes, you, you get distracted and it's very hard to keep track of all the information then because you're making sure you have everything. Um, but I just wanted to add as well, just um, back on about uh, the standpoint that you chose to adopt. I, I just want to point out, it's a fantastic book club book then as well, because you just have all these different questions that you can discuss with different people. So just wanted to point that out well, that'd, be, um, that'd be music to our publishers here <laughs> <laughs> but so. the, you know, people can because each each chapter has a kind of story to it exactly. that runs through so for example chapter two which is the property in animals has the story of darwin the ikea monkey and that just yeah. keeps running through even though uh, you hear the stories of other animals as you go through but it runs through and so you know the story the chapter about evidence has the story of the sniffer dogs and that just keeps coming back um yeah so we've we've tried to we have tried to tell it via stories which kind of grab people and you want to know what happens to the ikea monkey will sniffer dog evidence be admitted so on and so forth trying to uh grab people grab people's attention yeah and um and that was leading on to something else I wanted to ask which is obviously about the scope of the book um and the the breadth of material which you have in terms of not only in terms of the time period where you go from ancient to modern times but also it has quite a global perspective it's not just Australian stories and then as you said I think there's a story for everybody it it, it grabs people's attention in different ways um, thematically, there's very quirky stories which just pop out, but there's also very somber and sad stories. And also, I think they have different values as well. Like sometimes it's just random information which you just love to hear about um, that you want to share with other people. But other times it touches on some really core legal concepts or things about human law, which uh, has, has value in that respect. It's not just a funny story that you share with others. So I think it had a really fantastic variety to it um, and I guess I wanted to ask is that uh, why was it so important to you to cover such a breadth of material um, and was that in your intention from the start or did it just kind of escape from you as as you as you continued through this project I think it escaped a bit I mean th the thing about Jeremy and I is we're dabblers mm. so we will look into any area of law anywhere um, and think about it. But it also, it kind of felt to me, and I think I said that in the author's note at the end, felt to me like this book wanted to be written mm -hmm. and it was going to make us write it and it was going to tell all these absolutely 
like and when I was proofreading it I kind of forgot we wrote it and like there was some pages where I was laughing and then the next page I'm crying and, and I'm like oh my goodness like it, it's yeah it's uh, it was interesting to write and and to kind of read after a bit of a gap. Yeah, definitely. How about how about you, Jeremy? Yeah, no, no similarly. Look, I, I you know I came to it a bit from that idea of a, a an animal having its day in court, like an investor, and mm. I knew that I was going to have to cover, and I was always wondering how to do that. Some of the the criminal law side of things, which can can be very difficult reading and and difficult stuff at times. Um, but the the chapter that most surprised me personally was. Uh, the one on understanding animals, which is basically about evidence law. Uh, and that's something I knew nothing about, even though I'm an evidence lawyer, about the, the role animals sometimes play in evidence law. And I just kept on finding more and more interesting things to say there. So I learned a lot writing that chapter. And it was never part of my idea when we first started this one. So uh, that's just one example. There are some others as well of places we, we didn't expect to go. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, since you brought it up, actually, um, there's uh, the, what I found really interesting about understanding animals, and it's a theme that runs throughout the whole book as well, um, is this concept of the anthropomorphic fallacy, right? So the idea that we have a tendency to put uh, attribute human behavior to the behavior of animals, and this can produce some very interesting outcomes and very subjective and inconsistent um outcomes in the law as well and so that's definitely the case from uh, the research for example you did on evidence for that chapter understanding animals um could you could you maybe uh explain briefly these kinds of tensions that came up for you Jeremy when you're researching and how they played out across different jurisdictions in terms of this uh the ways that the anthropomorphic fallacy played out in evidence law yeah well, it, it played out literally in terms of evidence law so take <laughs> the dogs um which had a variety of roles they can sniff people and they can sniff drugs but uh constantly courts are trying to wedge them into the law and sometimes they think of sniffer dogs as as objects a, a, a powerful pair of binoculars or or a metal detector and other times they liken them to humans so you know the, the courts are trying to work out is a is it a search for a sniffer dog to come up at you and sniff? They think about what, well, what if a human came up and sniffed at you and so on. And uh, they reached some different conclusions on that as well. Um, and uh, there are some countries that still regard the evidence via animals as, as subject to the hearsay rule or the opinion rule, which to my mind are peculiarly human rules, but uh, they're never expressed as, as being about humans. They're just as expressed as being about hearsay or opinion. So different countries have, have come up with quite radically different views, which have then in turn shaped the entire role of animals in the courtroom in those jurisdictions. So those, those little decisions, as you said, about where to go with those, I don't know if it's a fallacy, but anyway, where to go with those yeah. analogies. Um, really changes then has real practical effects in those countries, at least as far as as the connection between animals and courtrooms go. And um, uh, I mean, the the standout example is is a chapter Katie was mostly responsible for, which was the, the idea of putting an animal on trial as if it is a human. Uh, that's where it's starkest. Although um, we, although those those trials are a thing of the past, there are similar kind of disputes and trials that happen today that aren't aren't that different yeah so that I mean that for me was what was really interesting the way that the law doesn't seem to be able to cope with animals really yeah. it just slides back and forth between animals as things yeah. animals as people sometimes even animals is better than people mm. like with the sniffer dogs I reckon sometimes they get more leeway than a human uh, rookie cop would for example um, but the law just doesn't know how to treat animals at all or how the law should treat animals and so you just get these really weird situations so for example in the animal trials they happened in 14th century France and basically uh, these animals were put on trial for murder mostly pigs at first but then it expanded out to other kinds of animals and there's a question uh, were they what did they think they were doing did they think that they were treating 
the animal like a person as equivalent to a person because there's some evidence that they were like they dressed the animal in clothing in some of the instances why I don't know um, they try and extract confessions from the animal they put the animal in jail they hang it like a human murderer or whatever but then on another level like is it was the motivation for these things actually this animal has behaved out of place it's mm -hmm. a domestic animal it has inverted the hierarchy by killing a human therefore we must punish it it has done a bad act which it is not supposed to do but then also things about motive like there's one one situation where they acquit some piglets <laughs> Because of the blood, uh, because they're piglets, right? Because they're yeah, they're piglets. They're young. <laughs> so the courts, the court says, "Oh, we're going to, um, you know, punish the mother. <laughs> uh, she shall be uh, <laughs> But the piglets were young and misled by their mother, <laughs> and they're acquitted. But then the owner says, "I don't want them anymore." <laughs> Well, and so someone else takes them, the, lo the local lord takes the animal, but um, the piglets, and I'm like, poor piglets, but... Um, the amazing thing is, this, although those trials are a thing of the past, you still get these decisions today which are looking at exactly the same issues. You get judges trying to, you know, working out which dog is to blame if they're yes. both misbehaved. Um, these days it's the owner who's formally being prosecuted although in reality it's typically it's because they, the authorities really want to do something about the the animal and even some of the criminal offenses where it's the owner in trouble for having a, a dog that attacks someone there are defenses written into the statute and there are defenses for the animal that the animal was provoked that someone trespassed on the animal's property um it's so it's not that difference we're still arguing about those same things just the the, the formalities uh, are different yeah. so one of the examples we use is sharks yes which is, um I which has that. relevance because mm -hmm. of unfortunate events lately but often in the wake of something like that people say the shark should be killed mm -hmm. and some american researchers did some experiments giving people fake magazine articles and basically people were a lot more punitive when the shark killed a child as opposed to when the shark killed a paedophile who hadn't been caught in the second instance they were like go for it shark in the first instance they were like the shark must pay it has to be that shark not any other shark and if pain is inflicted on the shark in killing it we don't care and that's really weird but this is the modern day right this retributive aspect still exists and without any regard to the shark's view of things no. I don't, I don't <laughs> yeah. the shark has a view on kids versus pedophiles at all um okay. yeah no and and does the shark even have the moral capacity to make well, a judgment about okay what it's doing is wrong i mean as far as it's concerned it's just being a shark um trying to eat its dinner doing its but, shark things yeah doing shark things <laughs> it was presumably yeah so do, do either of you and because i think that is like the value as well in in terms of uh, the timeline that you have for this book when when you point out these guilty pigs and then you the, you point out the fact that well actually have we you ask have we really changed um and I wonder, I know this is veering off the, stand, the neutral standpoint of the book, but do either of you think that we have progressed that much in terms of the way that we see animals then? Or do you think we're kind of stuck in the medieval, medieval mindset when it comes to those things? Or is it a complicated picture? I don't know. What, what are your thoughts? So, I think we're still confused. That's mm. my view. We're still really confused and we still don't know what to do. And the, that kind of confusion has existed from ancient times once we domesticated animals once we kind of brought them into our lives it's then like what is our relationship with them well that's my cow my dog mm. my bees even right <laughs> um but now what does that mean is the animal a thing is it a separate being um so i think I think it's basically still the same. The same problems are recurring from 
Mesopotamian times to now, we just don't know how to categorise our relationship with animals. And I think one of the standouts of that is this you know, big movement of the last 100 years, the big advance led by Jeremy Bentham um, mm. of, of making it a crime to be cruel to an animal, which of course is a massive advance and it's a really important step. But it's a very confusing step too, because you're not allowed to be cruel to, well, many animals. Um, you can still step on ants and, and, and lizards, um, but um, you can kill them um, and you can eat them and you can cage them. Uh, and all these other absolutely terrible things. It's just that you can't be cruel when you do any of that. And I think that's a pretty confusing, um, posi confused position to be in. It's very much focused on uh, what, what I'm sure you call as an anthropomorphic um, well, step, uh, which is assuming that animals feel the sort of things we do at certain times and feel pain and the like. Uh, but even that's an imagination. We don't really know how those animals feel. So there's even that big step forward uh, is a confusing step forward. And so are the next ones, the ones where we start, which we cover at the end of the book, where animals start to be treated uh, the same way, with some similarity to humans in terms of rights law, writs of habeas corpus and that sort of thing. Yes. It, it, it sounds like a big move and it's, a, it's, it's recognising that we're all just animals, um, just like the other animals are. But at the same time, when you start to try and apply those rules, you start to get some real mysteries about uh, if you're freeing an animal, where are you freeing the animal to? Uh, that sort of yeah. problem. Yeah, that kind of problem. With animals. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, exactly. And what counts? Like, well, uh, so I learned a lot about octopuses <laughs> from the final chapter. I was so glad <laughs> Jeremy chose the octopus that was our story because that. we kind of felt we'd been a bit, the only other kind of. I guess we did have bees, didn't we? And some weevils. Oh, a lot of bees, yes. Yeah, a lot of bees. That was me. I'm a bit obsessed by bees. But um I had a ball at the end trying to go back through the book and see which animals we had mentioned and which ones we left out, and then doing the whole classification of mammals and chordates and and all of that. Which which phylums did we cover? And it was pretty telling by the end that we'd pretty much focused on creatures that were most like us. Uh, so yeah. octopuses are so fun because they're absolutely nothing like us and yet um seem to have the kind of intelligence we associate with those closer animals so yeah. uh, really interesting one and one the law struggles with it's only relatively recently that octopuses have been wedged into some of the laws about cruelty and rights and all of that yeah and and like stories about octopuses taking the lids off tanks and uh, they're great and taking yeah. selfies, which I taking mean, the other, selfies. <laughs> the other famous <laughs> selfie story is the monkey selfie, the the macaque that took a supposedly took a selfie. It's a bit unclear in um, Sulawesi, mm. um, and that's a famous case. And it got litigated. The, the 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 macaque didn't just take a selfie, but actually brought an action um, against <laughs> the photographer. Um, and yet, uh, we conclude at the end with an Australian competition, which just by coincidence happened to come out as we we're writing, where an octopus took a selfie. No one's suing, although I still wonder whether the the octopus should have got the the main prize rather than the the photog the human photographer uh, in that case. Yeah, I think I think. Um... It's a it's it's a great example of the octopus in terms of what you were just saying before about how laws have not figured out animals and where they are and um, like you said there is this and it constantly affects everything in the book is this slippage of the status of animals whether we treat them like pop property or sentient beings or somewhere in between and so I think I, I really appreciate your answer about saying it's we, we haven't figured it out <laughs> I don't think we figured um, it out and no. I don't like um, yeah. I, I just don't think we've figured it out and I don't think the law knows how to deal with it very well because there's really difficult questions. Mm. Like in terms of, um, for example, there's a chimpanzee who behaves rather badly to someone who causes grievous bodily harm. Oh, if there's a take-home message to people from the book, it is do not own wild animals do not for, for for several reasons one is it's really cruel and you're really constraining them but the second reason is they're wild and they might you know eat you pull your head off bite your hand off like stuff like that don't do it so I'm never patting a zebra never yes. 
Zebra. No, my gosh. Because <laughs> my dad said, aren't they just stripy horses? I said, no, no, no. What you've got to remember about zebras is the apex predators are lions. They're, they're pretty feisty beasts and no, and you can't tame them. So, um, and then, you know, chimpanzees, for example, yeah, don't, but, but they obviously have a high level of intelligence and they have affection and they have that kind of stuff. So what do we do there mm. in terms of the chimpanzee who almost killed someone? Well, if it had survived, what would we have done to him? Mm. Exactly. Yeah. There's some constant tension between wanting to appreciate the sentience of animals, but then again, it, it's this idea that once we do that, how do we separate the sentience from human ideas of morality and what yep. it, and humanness? And well, on that, I, I, my next question, I, I, I'm worried about focusing too much on the animals almost because also part of your book and what you keep on coming back to and I'm sure you you know my next question is that all you're really doing is looking at human law when you're looking at animal law um so maybe Jeremy for example what what is one of the key things that you've learned about humans and particularly about human law in the process of writing this book or maybe there's a lot a lot that you've learned I guess <laughs> yeah um oh look uh I think well it's absolutely about human law, though. One, um, I mean, there's always a question of how much, say, the courts are leading other humans, judges, of course, are human too, uh, on ideas or whether they're following and whether um, statutes are, are leading or following. I mean, one one thing we kept noticing, and people would, once they learnt we were writing this book, would send us articles. And there's a recurrent thing in recent times of this and this parliament of some country has declared that animals are sentient. And therefore, that that means everything. And then we get excited. Then we go and look at it. And it's just a, a yet another incremental change <laughs> to the law that has now been packaged as a sea change. Mm. Um, and and I got a bit cynical about some of these after a while for that reason. I mean, there's some wonderful people out there doing animal law work, but occasionally I thought, yeah, there's a there's a bit of overselling of of how much human law can do. Um, and a lot of this isn't really about the law. It's about changing views. Um, in fact, we end the book with, with a bit of discussion, not of, of human laws, but just of human views about animals. And uh, again, with the octopus, that went from octopuses are weird and dangerous creatures uh, and, and tasty ones. Um, and, and then a shift, which wasn't a law shift. It was a, a shift that came from having videos and, and more exposure to, oh, maybe animals, uh, octopuses are friendly, safe, and you really shouldn't eat them, creatures. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I mean, that's part of the, that's part and parcel in part with the environmental movement. And that's, environmentalism is something we, we touched on in the book uh, because it governs partly that difference between domestic and wild animals. But um, uh, that movement isn't really a legal movement. It's a, it's a much broader movement than that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And, um, and I think that um, something which, which you just said, which really I, I really aligned with, which I figured found in the book was that um, a lot of the time the law is quite incongruent in terms of the way that it, it says it is and then how it plays out in real life. Um, and often, often that's also because of these, uh, these categories, you know, the law just in general, you need to put things into categories and decide that something belongs in a category. So um, what you come across in the book is you need to put animals in the category of wild or domestic or dangerous or not. Um, and I think one of the uh, the starkest examples for me was uh, the, the really dark chapter which you have about harming animals. And you look at the case of Daniel Brighton and because the court is, in this case, the court is confronted with this question where they have to define a pest. Oh, and, and and the outcome of it you point out in the book is that um, it essentially means that the people can deliberately inflict serious pain on animals without legal authority mm -hmm. if more than one animal of its kind shows a common propensity to be destructive and the person uses a technique where they're trying to kill as many of them as possible which you look at that and it, it makes no sense but I think that often happens in the law when we need to categorize things um, so were, were, were there any other stories for you, for example, Katie, when you were writing this book where you had to take a step back and be like, hang on, 
Like, why? How did they? Is this the correct label for these animals? Or so the big one is bees. Yeah, the bees. Yes. <laughs> so I, initially, I thought I was reading it wrongly because I had all these cases saying bees are wild. Bees are wild. Going right back to Roman times. Bees are wild. Bees are wild. Bees are wild. And then I found all these other cases and they said, bees are tame. Bees are tame. They're just <laughs> like cows, you know. Bees are really tame. I'm like... I, it's the same bee. I, I, don't, I don't get this. Like, how? <laughs> what's going on? And then I worked out what it was. I must write something about this at some point. They're wild for the purposes of property. Why? Because they're kind of uncontrollable. They just get up and swarm... And I guess that they're, they're like in some ways they're a unit and in some ways they're many little mm. uh, creatures. And then it's hard. You can't mark a bee, although the ancient Irish did try by sprinkling flour on them. But, um, yeah, for property purposes, they're treated as wild. Then for tort law purposes, if that bees sting people, are annoying, that kind of stuff. The law has a totally different attitude. It says, no, bees are tame. Bees are nice. Bees are helpful. They make us honey. Okay, they occasionally sting people, but then the poor things die anyway. Um, bees are nice. So it's kind of like, yeah, the law's put it in two competing categories and, and seems to be fine with that. Still haven't sorted it out. No. Nope. That's the, that's the central theme, I guess. <laughs> so, yeah, it was just like, but but don't you realise that this conflicts with everything you just said in this case? No? Do you don't see a problem with that? Okay. Definitely. And we see cult, cross-cultural differences as well. Um, I think, for example, in Australia, how we decide, uh, if I remember this correctly, decided that kangaroos aren't dangerous. Yeah, um, we did. No, kangaroos <laughs> aren't dangerous. Also, in England, flies are a nuisance, but in Australia, flies are not a nuisance. They crack me <laughs> off because I've lived in England. And uh, yeah, they do have a lot less flies. Whereas in Australia, it's just like you've got to live with it, guys. Yeah, I mean, one thing we, we tended, of course, naturally to look at Australian law first. Um, but we never want to stop there because the comparisons mm. are so interesting and the cases are everywhere. Um, but uh, it was there is a comparative aspect to this book, which was so much fun, which was just seeing how how different er how different everything was uh, across all those different countries. In part uh, because, as Katie said, Australia is just a really different place in terms of animals. But of course, that's not not the only explanation. Absolutely. Um, I'm just noting that we're unfortunately starting to run out of time, yeah. but I do have. Probably two more questions, but probably one of my most important questions, and maybe you've already answered it accidentally, but I really would love to know what your favourite story in the book is. I know it's impossible for me to answer, but I'd, I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts as to what was the most enjoyable part of it for you. My, my personal favourite was just a little story in the evidence chapter about um, a dog who's own classic property law dispute, who's the owner of this dog, uh, because someone had had their dog stolen and someone else has a dog that looks like it, but they can't work out where there is. And how did they solve that? They they brought the dog into the courtroom and yes. waited who it jumped on. And it was just such a beautiful little story. Um, uh, and uh, and even it's it's one of those where we did a bit of historical research trying to work out what happened afterwards because the disappointed owner, uh, non-owner, um, uh, threatened to sue all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, and that would have been wonderful. But he vanished from history at that point, so um, never found out, and no one knows still who the real owner of that dog is. So that was my my personal favorite. It's a great story, and well, and, and yeah, it, it's it. Um... That's another part that I liked about the book is that you always try to tell us where the animals end up at the end, which I think is really beautiful, actually. Definitely the most fun bit of writing, I think, was that little bit of research trying to find out what happened next. Um, what happened? Did, where where, every where's the before. animal? Um, you know, is he the Staffordshire Terrier is living happily mm -hmm. with new owners? Uh, things like that. We yeah, always want to find out the name of the animal too. We spent a lot of effort trying to find out the name of these these Israeli pets uh, that yeah. was like a oh, family yes. dispute because the, the case didn't mention their name or we couldn't tell because it was in Hebrew. And we, we spent a long time trying to work that out. That was so fun. 
Um, yeah, that, so for what it's worth, uh, the dog was called Shana and Jana, the cat okay. was called Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre. <laughs> uh, that common Israeli <laughs> name, Jane Eyre. <laughs> um, <laughs> just what, like, was, um, what was your favourite story in the book, Katie? Oh, oh it's so hard to choose. Um, I, I did like the swans. I mean, that's bizarre, but... Uh, the ownership of swans was just, I did not expect that started down that particular um, line of research. So does the queen own all the swans? The answer is she could own certain swans if she chose. <laughs> but there's this whole history to the swans, which is just bizarre. There were courts <clears throat> of swan moot. There were people whose office was to count up swans and keep it all in a book. And I'm just like, people? I mean, it says nothing about the swans. It says a lot about people. People are weird. People are so weird. <laughs> another, another central takeaway from this book. And the, the insignia that they, that, the, the, that they put on the swan beaks swans. is love the illustration that you included in the book of the different signs, the markings that they put on the beaks as well to say that's my swan and it's just so so weird it's the it's the precursor to trademark law seriously wow. and that's just and I was yeah. like I did not expect to find this in my research so I think that was one of my favorite bits be my first question when we get King Charles is what's he going to do with those swans <laughs> is he going to claim them or not I'll ask him because the Queen's website I went to the Queen's website and it says uh, she has no desire to claim the swans. We actually end the book with a, a little story about Prince Philip that went around, um, especially this last couple of years. He, he was, everyone was asked which animal they'd like to be and everyone just said dogs and cats. But he said he wanted to be a virus that took down the world's population because that would be better for the rest of the animals. He was joking, of course, but it was poignant given um, the events of the last couple of years, including his death. Yeah. So. Yes, and um, you note in the book that the, the price of the book where it says that quote now is it's quite a, it's a rare book now because it's actually the only one of the few things we just tried to try tried to find and couldn't I'll grab it whenever I can but we had to rely on on secondhand takes of that book just to, to finish that off. Fascinating. Yeah. Um, and well, speaking speaking of speaking of that, uh, one last question, and then we probably have to wrap up, unfortunately. But the, the other thing whilst I was reading it, seeing as we, at the end, we're looking to the future now. Um, I kept on thinking about all the stories that kept on popping up um, whilst I was reading in my mind, m recent stories, uh, like even um, like the culling of hamsters in, in Hong Kong to mitigate the COVID outbreak. Fast, like sad, but interesting. Um, in it, Denmark, I think. Yeah, exactly. Like it has a lot of links with what you've been writing about. And then yes, like the the shark attack in Sydney and the ongoing Grumby battle as well. That's that's also um, scaled up quite a lot. I think there was a Four Corners report for it the other week. Um, yeah. Are there any events since writing that book that you wish you could have included or are you thinking of a sequel by any chance? Or? <laughs> Quite a lot of talk. There's, there's room for a sequel. Um, Absolutely. Or something. There is a, there's a, a, Big case coming up in New York about, it was actually covered in the New York last week, but it was too late for us. We, we touch on some of it about uh, an elephant in the Bronx Zoo named Happy. Um, and someone's, an organisation is trying to get happiest corpus for happy. Uh, and it's a, a long, lovely story, which we would love to tell at some point, though. The, the, people have been telling it. And there's a, the New York Court of Appeals has surprised everyone by saying it wants to take the case. I don't think happy will end up uh, being freed or whatever mm. but uh it's clear the judges want to want to dig into it and think hard about it so i think that's going to be big when it comes out watch this i just keep seeing stuff that i'd put in volume <laughs> two jeremy i'm just putting it out there <laughs> well you're both great uh creative collaborators obviously so you know <laughs> <laughs> if there's guilty pigs too you'll know <laughs> we kept collecting Great. Well, uh, unfortunately, I probably will have to wrap this yeah. up here. But thank you so much for your time. Um, it was an absolute pleasure discussing your book. So to repeat, it's called Guilty Pigs, The Weird and Wonderful History of Animal, animal Law. And 
for anyone who's watching this, the book is out. So if you're interested, you can definitely get a copy online or at your local bookstore. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Oh, it's we're Beautiful. just delighted to be interviewed by you. Yeah.